Thank you. Uh, yeah, as I said, um, I want to give you a short introduction on how to develop a mindset for web security. And we're, when we're talking about security, the problems are almost self-made. We have this very fast product development cycle. We, have, we want to achieve short time to market span. We use tools like rapid prototyping. And because of all this time pressure, insecure prototypes often find their way into production. And I think most of you have already heard this before. Yeah, OK, we ship it, and uh, we care about the details later, and we know exactly how this works for stuff like accessibility and code documentation. So if security is not a concern for your project in the beginning, how could you expect it to be later on? Because security is an ongoing process throughout your project's entire lifetime. You have to constantly reevaluate your project goals. You have to audit the code and think about pros uh, possible threats. So how we can, uh, can we achieve this mindset right from the beginning? And uh, one approach that really helps with this is called defensive programming. The basic rule is it starts with secure input and output handling, which basically means don't trust any user input. And when we're talking about user input, we start with the URL. This may include path parameters or query parameters. We have stuff like the HTTP method. Is it a simple GET request or do we post or even delete information? And of course, the HTTP headers that we are using. The most common that you're uh, probably thinking of are form values, file uploads, multiparts, and also stuff like cookies and browser, stack, uh, browser storage like local storage, session storage, or if you're using uh, IndexedDB, which is a browser-based database. And of course, every kind of data exchange with APIs, with Flash, with applets, and so on. So with all this kind of input, we want to validate it first. We have three different types of validation. One is the simple data type validation. I'm uh, talking about strings, numbers, uh, date objects. Is uh, a return value undefined? We have range and constraint validation. So do we uh, act on positive or negative numbers? Do we have uh, the exponential, um, exponential uh, type of definition? We're checking for string length and stuff like uh, your age can probably be 200 years if you're still alive. And of course, your business logic, uh, you need to um, validate for your special use cases. And after that, we're going to sanitize the user input, which means we want to remove possibly uh, harmful content from the user input and avoid code injection or even remote code execution. This, for example, includes uh, ASCII control characters, the bell, for example, or um, others, null bytes, which can be problematic when you deal with uh, string length and file upload, Unicode RTL control characters, which lets you switch the direction of the text you're actually using, Unicode white space, which is often used to uh, bypass regular white space checks, so there are more than one characters used for white space, and this can be a problem. And usually you, you want to remove all HTML because it can contain scripts, it can contain iframes, it can be used for cross-site scripting attacks or other attacks like dumb clobbering. And if you're really dependent on HTML being available in your user input, you want to strictly whitelist it to narrow it down what's really allowed, what's uh, forbidden. And the important thing is you should never use regular expressions for filtering HTML. Um, in the beginning it might seem logical to go, okay, it starts with an angle bracket and it ends with an angle bracket and I can filter in between. But there's so much stuff you have to think about. You have attributes which can contain scripts or even trigger other scripts. And there's a lot of junk that a browser accepts which may bypass your regular expression, but it's totally fine for the browser to make something like HTML of it. So this is too important to use regular expressions for that. 
There are good libraries for um, completely filtering out unwanted input to limit it down to a subset of text that are allowed, and this is much more safer to use stuff like that. And in some cases, you need to encode the output afterwards. And you need the, uh, to choose the encoding depending on the context. And this is absolutely crucial because um, the characters which need to be escaped or encoded in your output differs from your context. For example, if you have um, plain HTML text, you don't have to mask a lot of stuff. You probably uh, are checking for uh, if the star tag and add tag matches and then you just inject it into your, um, into your template and you're good with that. But for example, if you have content which goes into HTML attributes, you have to filter <coughs> Uh, stuff like quotes, double quotes, uh, angle brackets, um, or um, when you're dealing with JSON, the um, encoding characters are different there as well. So you have the double quotes, the backslash, new line. So it always is crucial to look at your context, where you put, uh, where you output uh, the stuff, to make sure you, you choose the uh, proper encoding. Another important thing are dependencies. And when you're dealing with dependencies in your projects, you'll have two main issues. The first one is you should never assume that the frameworks or libraries you're using use secure defaults. So many framework creators consider the developer using that framework to be responsible for security. And we often know this doesn't happen because we just use uh, we find a framework somewhere, we just link it and uh, use it, and we think maybe uh, the author took care of all this. So in the end, no one really feels responsible for checking inputs and output and validating that everything works as expected. So you have to be really careful with that. And the other thing is to keep stuff up to date. And when you're looking at the top 100,000 websites on Alexa, you have 75% uh, using a jQuery version that it's older than two and a half years. And even worse, 35% use a version that is older than five. And we were talking about version 1.4 at that moment. So that's pretty old and there have been many, many security related fixes until that. Um, and when this is an issue with jQuery, what is with the, your other dependencies, with your server side dependencies? Are they up to date as well, or have the same issue? Unfortunately, there, um, there's a good method you can use. There's once the Node Security Project and a project that is called RetireJS. The Node Security Project uh, collects security advisories for all NPM modules and publishes it. And you can basically scan your entire package JSON and looking for vulnerable dependencies. And RetireJS does the same for front-end dependencies like jQuery, Angular, Backbone, or Ember. And it's still pretty cumbersome to do this check all the time by hand when you're modifying your framework, when you're adding a new dependency, when you're removing something. So this is the part where you make security part of your build process. You can use both the node security project and the retire.js as command line tool and as grunt and gulp task, so you can really automate the scanning for vulnerable dependencies. The same is true for uh, outdated dependencies. There's a command like uh, npm outdated, which lists all the outdated dependencies in your project and help you, helps you to find an update path for it. Of course, most of you are already linked in your code and um, hopefully write unit tests as well. So you should always aim to have a high, co high code coverage uh, for your tests to make sure that every part of your application is completely tested. And you can also check all your inputs, forms, APIs, during your integration tests. Feed them with invalid input, with null bytes, with Unicode characters. What happens when you use HTML snippets or possible cross-site scripting vectors? Another part which is often overlooked is secure communication. 
When it comes to developing our applications, we often forget that the web doesn't look like this. It's actually something more similar to this one. So we have many servers in between. We don't know which path the data takes from our server to the client. And HTTP is a plain text protocol, and as such, it can be modified during every step in between your server and the client. So you may up with a, uh, end up with a scenario like this. And there's no guarantee that the user will get the exact same information you served. When we're uh, talking about attacks, this is called man-in-the-middle attack. But it doesn't have to be malicious, because think of public Wi-Fi, corporate proxies in uh, huge corporations, telecom providers or mobile carriers who are manip uh, manipulating, compressing data, changing data, and also country-specific content filters. So for this, I recommend using HTTPS with the Transport Layer Security Protocol, or TLS for short. This is the succeeding protocol to SSL, you already may know. And um, you should basically use it for all sites storing any kind of user data, especially when it comes to banking data, credit card information. So as soon as your website uses a login to um, store user information behind it, to have a social profile, whatever, use HTTPS. But also, if you're offering downloads or using software up, uh, delivering software updates, because also your downloads and files can be modified during all this process. Maybe they contain Trojans or other malware afterwards. So this is absolutely critical when you have an application with an automated update mechanism. You want to be sure that the update you're serving is exactly that that you delivered. And it will also become a big issue for the so-called Internet of Things. With everything being connected and um, most protocols used during this uh, have no security at all, are plain text or have very, very basic security limits. So a um, few weeks back, BMW had this problem with the connected car technology, which is basically uh, a mechanism to allow you to open your car with your mobile phone. And this was even found by accident that they didn't use a secure communication. So with a very simple setup, you can open the door of another person's car. And it was two million vehicles affected. So this effect does scale, and this really can become a problem. So you should make sure that all your content you're using is delivered with HTTPS. And for your website, this means every bit of content must be delivered via HTTPS. So you don't get any mixed content warning. This also includes ads, analytics, widgets you're using, social media integration. This is really important. Because it's enough if one resource is uh, transferred by a regular unsafe HTTP connection to make the entire site vulnerable. And if you want to make sure that this doesn't happen and you want the HTTPS to stick, there's an HTTP header called HTTP Strict Transport Security. You just send it with to the uh, you just send it with your with a request to the browser and tell them, okay, whatever you see in the document, make sure that you always request your resources through HTTPS and don't fall back to a regular HTTP connection. But you also need to be aware of side channels and seal them using a technique called content security policy, which is another uh, HTTP header you can send. This is basically a whitelist of resources and scripts that are allowed on your page. You can completely define uh, which first-party scripts are allowed, which second-party scripts are allowed. If you're using uh, iframes on your website, for example, for, for YouTube or uh, Discuss, to let them through and block everything else, and also for CSS, images, web fonts, because you don't need necessarily scripts to attack your website. And this is also not a completely uncommon problem. Uh, last year, Google had this issue with their double-click ad service, which included 
one ad with uh, malicious code and it will spread to millions and millions of websites. So even if your entire website is completely secure, you can completely mess it up with having insecure third-party content. So now we saw a lot of things to consider and it's hard to keep an eye on them for all the time. So the best thing you do is you gather metrics to find out what's really going on in your application or on your website. And the best thing to do is use centralized logging where all the log files gather at one place and you can use this to detect unusual behavior patterns like login or passwords resets, file access attempts or activities from other IP ranges. And you can set up uh, automated notification and alerts so you're really quickly aware what's going on if someone is trying to mess with your site. Because security is always an ongoing effort. You always have to revise the tools, the processes, and it also helps to have regular security audits. And they're really much cheaper than dealing with a PR disaster afterwards after your site got hacked. So for those of you who want to go deeper into the subject and um, want to get started to care about web security, I compile a huge list of resources for you uh, where you can find blog posts, tools, um, how to set up SSL on your uh, server and configure it uh, securely. Uh, you can find this online and um, this is the link for it. And that's the introduction to web security coming from me and thank you very much.